My name is Tim Schultz, and uh, welcome to the Hands-On Scythe Purple Team Workshop. So George and a couple of my colleagues are going to be helping me out uh, with sort of the Q&A and the uh, any questions you all may have or, or comments in the chat. I think they're monitoring it. So if you have any problems or anything with uh, with the lab and some of that, I know a couple of folks have mentioned that they didn't get links quite yet. So um, that was if you're still having issues in a few minutes, just share it with uh, with the chat and we will. Uh, and by we, I mean, George and and others are going to be uh, working on that in the background. So it's just something to for people to you should get. Um, access to the labs. And then the other question is, will uh, attending get a certificate? So we do go over CPs. Uh, at the end of the lab, you will be able to uh, print out a little certificate that says you participated in this workshop. So just jumping into that. So, all right, I'm going to kill my video and we'll get started. So a little bit about me, for those of you who may not know. Uh, so I recently started about a month, uh, a month and change ago as the new adversary emulation lead for Scythe. So and prior to that, I spent six years at uh, the FFRDCs uh, at Sandia National Labs. And then the other one you may be very familiar with is MITRE. So I did a lot of work with uh, their adversary emulation team, sort of building that out. I also uh, did bread teaming exercise and then ended up doing uh, what we've now sort of defined as purple teaming, although it wasn't quite called that at the time. So I also have some experience uh, dealing with ICS and some of the questions around that. Uh, so, and before all of my FFRDC experience, I did some open source intelligence gathering work, as well as helping uh, train law enforcement officers on digital forensics, like how not to mess up uh, any evidence they collect and things like that. So I did that for a couple of years. So overall, the sort of work, uh, format of the workshop. So we have this uh, new environment for you to go play around with uh, and work through some uh, CTI problems, some red team, uh, get to play the, the, the role of the red team, and then a little bit of the blue team as well, and sort of see how a purple team exercise uh, can work if you're playing all three roles. So we've built it on the VMware learning platform. As I mentioned before, everyone should have received an email with a unique URL. And if and some, I think we're uh, building out the labs and sort of scaling it as people come in. So if there's a little bit of a delay, that might be might be the reason. So as you're you know now, we have a little bit of a lecture to introduce key concepts and three hours of total time to play in the lab environment. If you are already, you know, super, you, you already know all about purple teaming and everything. Maybe you've heard our pitch before, something like that. You know, you can throw me on mute if you really want and uh, just go play in the lab. Uh, it's not a requirement to uh, listen to this portion, but I know purple teaming or sort of how we've been doing purple teaming at Scythe is something that's a bit of a new concept to folks. So that's where uh, this lecture sort of comes in and how we approach it. Um, what we're doing. And so the core concepts are something that we're hoping you can take back to your organization. And so in the lab, there's four different systems. We have uh, the unicorn uh, is your main one. That's the uh, that's the site system. And so that's where you have the site pl site platform, uh, the SAN slingshot C2 matrix edition. This is has a bunch of different command and control uh, options installed if you want to play around with those will say that that is open source, so you can play around with that afterward, where Scythe is uh, only in this lab. So I'd encourage you to experiment around with the tool while you have access. And then we have a domain controller as well. So even though, especially when I'm uh, going through our lecture and then later going into uh, and sort of demoing the VMware environment, uh, I'm just going to run through everything real quick just so people can follow along if they want and don't, uh, don't want to necessarily do it themselves. Uh, but that's where, if you want some extra credit, you can go and play around and try and uh, discover some vulnerabilities that I think George has built into the lab. So with that, uh, start with the takeaways. What are the things that we want you to take from this workshop? So obviously learning about purple teaming and sort of taking that back to work. A big part of purple teaming, as we'll get into, is communication. 
It is understanding how to merge uh, a couple of different skill sets into a single uh, sort of event or a mindset. And so that's ultimately what we are hoping to help, uh, you know, educate and, and bring this mindset across information security. And so part of that is equipping you with, with that knowledge. And then some of the tools that we've released, uh, these being, you know, the Purple Team Exercise Framework, which we'll cover a little bit later, uh, our Threat Thursdays, where we release new threats, and then, in of course, the Scythe Enterprise Platform. So while this is, of course, about purple teaming in general, you know, this is, we are Scythe. We do have uh, an enterprise platform as well as some services. And so those are obviously sort of our, our core parts of our business. And so uh, as someone asked before, uh, we do have CPE credits and you will get those at the end of the lab. So in order to get those, you will need to do the lab. So overall, this is sort of just an, what are we going to be learning? We're going to walk through what is purple teaming. We're going to talk about ethical hacking evolution and in general sort of offensive tradecraft. Go through some frameworks and methodologies that are useful for the types of work we're doing. Dive into a little bit of cyber threat intel. And then we're going to go into the exercises themselves and sort of the prep, the lessons learned, and then we'll jump into the workshop. So first, what is a purple team? So most folks might know that on a color wheel, right? If you merge red, red team and blue team, which are uh, you know pretty common terms in information security, we get uh, the uh, blended color there is the purple team. And so what does this mean? Uh, it's really, as I mentioned before, it's a couple different domains of expertise within cybersecurity that are all being sort of leveraged as one. And that's where you see here we break out cyber threat intel is that research and threat TTPs that are happening, whether it's specific to an organization, whether it's specific to a specific threat group, it's sort of a data-driven th uh, or threat-driven uh, red teaming. And so it is a bit more, uh, it's a lot more collaborative is how purple teaming, we really like to um, advertise it and talk about it, but it's really just a harmonious uh, working together between these three teams doesn't always work out uh, quite as you expect. So as we, I talked about, it's like, how hard can it be? We just hope that we can put the red team and blue team together in one room and say, all right, you're good to go. Everyone's going to work together. So, and then we just have uh, a couple little memes here. And this is sometimes what ends up happening. So this is George and I uh, and others probably on this call can all, uh, probably empathize a little bit with trying to get uh, two different teams and organizations to sort of work together when sometimes they have competing goals. Sometimes this can be because they have different, uh, different structures and different bosses that they report to. And so that can create different incentives for the teams. And so that's what we sort of want to walk through here is what, what do we do to get to purple? So one example we want to give is sort of a success story. Start off with this. This is, you know, is purple team just a theory or is this something that you can actually apply? And so this is uh, an instance where at Scythe, we have actually gone and been able to apply this purple teaming methodology. Uh, and, and you'll see down there the logo, the National Motor Freight Traffic Association brought Scythe in for a, a six-week purple team exercise was an assumed breach scenario. So that's something that sort of a core part of Purple Team we'll talk about in a little bit. And so we were uh, hired to perform all three roles, both the red team, the blue team, and the threat intelligence. So the same roles that you're going to be asked to do in the lab. And so the challenge was that there was no budget left to spend on new technology. And so that was sort of the overall challenge is that uh, the recommendations couldn't be go and buy this product or go and buy this product. So it was only tuning current security tools and controls that were there. And so the way Scythe sort of set this up is we decided to do, it was a six week, uh, six week purple team. And so we divided those six weeks into six different threats. So with week one being some baseline testing, this is just to make sure that initial execution works, some of the command and control mechanisms are working, and to understand from the defender perspective what controls were in place, what's working, just to make sure that those types of things are all, you know, in a longer purple team exercise like this, 
This is sort of that building that foundation out to understand just how effective these weeks two through six are going to be when it comes to training. Uh, and so this is where you can see it was a bunch of different uh, threat actors. And so, so as you see, there was a switch between Chinese, Russian and Iranian threat actors for weeks two through four, and then sort of moving into higher sophisticated sophistication actors with the very last week being a red team, just free play essentially. And so they can, you know, and this is how we like to sort of build a maturity model is starting with foundational techniques, moving to threat actors that have a, a emulation plan already that we've created, and then moving into, you know, a free play red team that can test all sorts of techniques that may not have been covered by these. So I'll take a second to check Q and A. We're good. Okay, cool. So just to give you an idea of where we started with this. So that first uh, baseline week and some of those tests that were run, 94% uh, undetected. And so this is that there weren't alerts that were generated. You can see, you know, if you can read the smaller numbers here, few things were detected. One thing was prevented or blocked, um, but overall 94% was not detected just based on uh, the techniques that were run at the beginning. And then running those same things at the end, the end result, again, no new technology uh, enabled Sysmon telemetry you know, being able to log these this information is really important and something that we emphasize in our purple teaming is not just detections, but also being able to log things so that you have that information to perform some sort of analysis on for hunt teams, for example. And so uh, this was, they had a uh, seam and that was an event sentry. And so the site team uh, wrote detections that were based on some of the, the techniques and sort of did that detection engineering uh, blue team perspective. And at the very end, we got it to 64% detection. Uh, and that again, you know, really want to emphasize that $0 in new technology was spent. And so the, the sort of theme here is that uh, a lot of times tuning is really what it takes uh, to understand. And it's sort of an easy test platform to validate those tuning and results. Some of the challenges with bringing in uh, some really good red teams is that they do fantastic work. And then at the end, you know, I've been on one of those red teams and you leave a report and then you come back in six months or a year. And so sometimes that, uh, that lag time makes it really difficult to validate whether those tests and results are working. And so because we use this purple team framework, you know, week to week, we're really able to not only uh, test whether or not these, detect these detections worked, but also continue to uh, stress whether it was, uh, you know, just a, by changing the threat actors, we were able to test different types of techniques to make sure that we weren't writing a very specific alert that only only worked on, you know, one test case, for instance. So this is something before we get into uh, sort of how do we get to adversary emulation and purple teaming uh, that, that we like to sort of throw out is that all offensive security is about providing value. This is uh, sort of a core tenet of purple teaming is that this is not about showcasing how bad an organization is, how many things that they weren't able to detect, but really about how do we use offensive testing and offensive security to improve and validate what the organization is going to go up against? And so this is, you know, trying to make it pretty clear cut uh, at the beginning of all of these slides. So uh, we've created an ethical hacking maturity model. And so uh, depending on what part of the organization you're in, you may uh, touch one of these points here at the bottom from vulnerability scanning all the way to adversary emulation. And so it sort of goes from working from CVEs um, all the way to tactics, techniques, and procedures, which are very different uh, because CVEs, you're often looking at patching, things like that. And as you move to the right, that's where it requires a bit more um, analysis and, and sort of I'll call it a you know detection engineering and tradecraft on the on the blue team and defensive side in order to figure out how to stop, prevent, detect, and log 
the uh, behaviors that adversaries are exploiting. And so uh, we talked a little bit earlier, sort of highlighted what assumed breach was. So this is where uh, we assume, you know, pulling on current events, you know, I used to pull on solar winds and now we have the outlook uh, zero days, you know, that's the question always comes up. Well, what if there's a zero day? What if there's an insider threat? You know, stuff like that. Assume breach as a model uh, sort of helps answer that by just saying those are going to happen. There is going to be someone that clicks something. There is going to be uh, a zero day that comes out that is leveraged by an adversary to gain that initial access. The question is, what can you do afterward? And so that's where sort of our last point is testing technology is not enough here and not just what technical controls can either prevent, log, things like that. But how do people respond when those events do happen? Do you have a hunt team that should find these things within a certain time frame, even if they're not detected? That's those are the key parts of purple team in this maturity model that we're sort of building towards. So we do have links. I think we'll send out the slides uh, afterward as well, just so people are aware of um, that. So you don't have to take too many notes. So just to sort of highlight what different, a couple different things about red teams. I've touched on a few of these, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here. The key thing I'm gonna highlight is over on the right, the customer is the blue team. Overall, the red team and offensive security is all about generating, uh, is, is that return on investment for the organization's defensive security posture. So making the blue team better, you're testing assumptions. And so overall, you are also training people, right? You want to build out a, the best defensive team possible. And this, and this is where there's been a bit of a, you know, communication differences between red and blue. And some events, it, it tends to be more adversarial of a relationship when at the end of the day, everyone should be hoping for the best for the outcome of the organization. So even us as Scythe, you know, if we go into an environment and, you know, people have detected and blocked everything that our tool does, I mean, that would be great. Um, you know, having really mature organizations that have trained their teams up, like that is, that is our end goal is making people more secure. And so the blue team is sort of everyone else. So again, I'll, I'll talk about their customer here. It's the entire organization. They're responsible, whether you are in the security operations center, the hunt team, uh, digital forensics, whatever part of the cycle you're in, if you are trying to protect the organization, this is you. And so I uh, talked a little bit about logging and alerting. And so these are all the different things that we are trying to test when it comes to the purple team. So adversary emulation. This is that intelligence-driven testing that's done uh, through a combination of both cyber uh, threat intelligence and the red team, typically. Uh, I like to think of very deliberate red teaming uh, and testing. Because most red teams, you have a lot of smart people that you've put on a team and you sort of let them go and say, you know, find, it, find a vulnerability, find a weakness, something like that. And so find a way in maybe give them a goal, whether it's get domain admin, a specific document, something like that. But the challenge is that when it goes to linking what those what the tests and the exploits and the abuse cases that the adversary emulation uh, or that the red team is used, it's often difficult to link it up into a framework the blue team is also uh, familiar with. So this is where uh, adversary emulation, you know, I'll highlight here, uh, MITRE ATT&CK. So I am from MITRE and, and most of you have probably heard of ATT&CK in some uh, form or fashion. And so that's something that uh, is that common language that we'll sort of get into later that I think really helps uh, make adversary emulation at least a, a really good return on investment because you have that communication model that's common. So this is where maybe moving towards a purple team. So you have our Scythe unicorns there. And so let's talk overall about purple team exercises. So what do they look like? What are, what are we trying to do? So basically what we are trying to do uh, in a purple team exercise is run a emulation. So the red portion or the uh, adversarial portion and understand what is supposed to happen, and then sort of get that ground truth is what really happens. So to give an example of one that George and I have done uh, in the past was 
where you would execute a technique and then and part of the questions we would ask the blue team before we execute it is let's write down what is supposed to happen what do you think will happen what are the processes in your organization say should happen and so we write those down and then we execute the technique and then we do a check afterwards did this happen? Did something happen that it wasn't supposed to? Did someone that was, you know, in one case, we had someone that was an outside of the purple team uh, exercise contacted the blue team and said, hey, I just saw this happen. And so that was something that they were unaware of that this person was monitoring for specific things. And so those are that's really where purple team uh, comes in. And so that's where, you know, we've got some nice bullet points laying everything out there. But ideally, what we're doing then is if if the organization, the blue team and the SOC can make those changes, you know, quickly, depending on the size of the organization, uh, the bigger it gets, the, the more, uh, you know, sign offs and, and verification you have to do. But then we could repeat uh, that same exercise again. And so a site that's really uh, nice and easy, as you'll get to see later. So I've mentioned a couple of these already. So that's where, you know, when do we want a purple team? Uh, whenever you're training defenders, it works really well. You're testing the processes between those security teams that can be red and blue. That can be, um, you know, the general SOC teams and the incident response, depending on how uh, your defensive uh, structure is. And then if there are new TTPs that come out, whether it's a, a new uh, exploit that's found, something like that, then uh, or in preparation of a red team engagement, or what I really like with some of these, the automation frameworks like Scythe, is a replay of a red team engagement. So this is something that the red teams can uh, transition afterward is take all of the techniques and tests that they've done put them in uh you know i'll say one of the automation frameworks obviously scythe is one of those and then you've now left your blue team with a easy button where they can keep replaying what was done before this allows the red team to focus on coming up with their new techniques the latest and greatest stuff to do that you know research and it allows the blue team to sort of hone on what was done before and without having to call the red team in every time to retest. And so it, it allows a really nice sort of you know, synergy between the teams because the red team isn't trying to replay all of these things over and over again and using you know, potentially time and resources that they could spend trying to find the next best thing or the next adversarial TTP that's needed uh, for testing the blue team. So, and, and ultimately, you know, I've mentioned a few times that uh, communication is really important. And so fostering a collaborative culture within the organization is really, really important. You know, having red teams and blue teams talk to each other on a regular basis, understanding that just because someone on the blue team writes a new detection that, you know, uh, finds a lot of the things the red team did before, that that is not a bad thing. And that is what you should be going towards. So, Framework and methodology. There are a bunch of these listed. Um, you know, I've seen people that either swear by methodologies or throw them out the window and say, "Ah, eh, they're too high level." So the way I like to think about it is, methodologies are sort of they're your foundation from a where do you go next if you get stuck or what is what is sort of your process. So I always like outlining them whenever we're doing an assessment, I've whether it was a red team assessment or anything, try to lay out what is our overall goal at a high level. Methodologies are great because uh, they can speak to people across domains. They're pre normally pretty easy to understand. Uh, you can see on the right, our purple team exercise framework there and sort of the four different things that that we've outlined as important. But uh, as far as our testing framework that we're going to work through, it's going to be attack. So we are going to highlight the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain as sort of one of the first big, uh, you know, kill chain is something we, we still hear used all the time. And, uh, you know, it has a lot of focus on that uh, sort of initial stages of development delivery. And it's big you know, the authors recently released, I forget, I think it was a 10 or 20 year, uh, you know, anniversary of the cyber kill chain. They talked about, you know, one of the big changes that they had tried to drive with it is that defenders could focus on any step of 
of this stage instead of having to try and tackle adversaries as this entirety um, and, and people were being overwhelmed. And so, uh, you know, the two parts we're really going to focus on are those last two is that command and control and the actions on objectives, because this is that post exploitation opportunities. And so command and control is obviously your, uh, your network detections and things like that. And that's going to be through just, uh, general trying to communicate outside of your organization internally. And then the actions on objectives, these are going to be those things that happen on the host that are detections. And that's, that's really the parts we're going to focus on here. So this is our, you've heard me mention MITRE attack. You know, I, I uh, lived and breathed attack for, for a couple of years. And so um, this is just a kind of overall slide for people that haven't maybe seen it uh, either recently or before. Across the top heading each column is the tactic. That is your uh, adversarial goal. And then underneath it are the techniques. And those are the technical means by which those goals are achieved. So it's a really great framework. It can be a lot to try and take in all at once. Something to keep in mind, you shouldn't try and go for 100% coverage uh, because that is, I'm not gonna say impossible because I'm sure someone would, would maybe say they could do it, but it's uh, each of these techniques is not really a, a checkbox. Uh, it's more of, there's a lot of depth to each one. And so ensuring that you understand the, the cyber threat intelligence component that we're going to jump into is picking and choosing what techniques that you really want to have a deep, uh, deep expertise in either detecting, preventing, things like that. So sort of deliberate choosing. So I mentioned the Purple Team Exercise Framework. We do have that on our site. It's free to download. Uh, you can download it and sort of follow along with the uh, next set of slides I'm going to go through, or you can do it afterward. So as I mentioned before, it's free. It's not just limited to, uh, to this workshop. So overall, when we are doing a purple team exercise, uh, we, we want to have some very specific roles, responsibilities. Some of, sometimes, as I mentioned before, like when, uh, when Scythe did the uh, the earlier case study that I mentioned, uh, we were the red team, the blue team, and the cyber threat intelligence. So it can all, you know, there may be uh, a single person or two people that serve several roles. That is okay, and that's normal. Uh, but it does help to at least have what are these titles, what are these roles, what are the responsibilities of, of everyone? And so... It's just, just information to collect. And so depending on your organization and how you do things, maybe everyone's part of the same team. But if, for instance, if you need sign-offs from, from the red team lead and the blue team lead, and you know maybe a, a third party, maybe the CIO or the CISO, depending on how high up you need to go to get some of these things approved, uh, you know we always recommend going as high as you can uh, with, with sign-offs. But that also, depending on whether you are doing it internally at your or own organization, or for instance, if we come in and do a purple team exercise, you know, we want to make sure that we have approvals from all of the right people in an organization. So not going to read all these off, but basically it's sort of those, those key uh, areas of expertise we talked about, cyber threat intelligence, red team, blue team, those and, and sort of the, the different components of each. So uh, how do you convince people that that purple teaming is worth doing? So we've highlighted a couple of things before. Um, you know, you're going to have to get uh, exercise budget goals, you know, basically depending on how many people uh, you need, you know, you may need from the SOC. That's something that's always a challenge is I don't think I've ever, at least in my experience, met a SOC that had nothing going on. So how do you divide up who comes in and sits in a, you know, if it's a one day training and a one day purple team exercise, that's one thing. But as we mentioned before, if it gets to a multi week exercise, then obviously, you know, adversaries are still operating. So ensuring that the organization still feels like the purple teaming isn't actually going to detract from their security posture is really important. So um, making sure that you have lots of different uh, members of teams sort of involved, depending again on the size of the organization. Uh, these may all be separate uh, departments, uh, or they could all be a set of like four people. So we've we've run an exercise with both. Uh, that's just something to know. 
So the time requirements, as I mentioned, sort of highlighted this already. Uh, this is more just for sort of a, a high level coverage of, of the different uh, parts of the framework. So you can do a two hour one where you're only testing a few specific TTPs, uh, you know, red canaries, uh, atomic, or yeah, red canaries, atomic red team uh, framework can, can work nicely if you're only testing one or two things uh, or you can run an entire campaign like that uh, in Scythe for, and then, uh, you know, wait for logs and things like that to populate. Sometimes there's lag times. Those are things that you can discover when you're doing purple teams. So all this stuff depends. Preparation can take anywhere from, you know, a few hours or, or minutes if you're an internal purple team or it could take weeks to set up and make sure that the appropriate firewall exceptions are made and that you know everyone is, is notified that this is an event that's happening. There may be alerts that show up. It doesn't mean necessarily that we are being hacked. That's just, uh, again, I keep bringing up size of the organization because that tends to be uh, a very large factor in determining lead times. So a couple of my colleagues from a few years ago, uh, Katie Nichols and Cody Thomas, uh, gave a really nice talk on sort of how do you take cyber threat intelligence and then move it all the way uh, through uh, some methodology to actually emulate an adversary. And so this is the nice little, you know, it's a it's a kill chain essentially that that they uh, created. And so this is a nice little graphic for it where you are understanding who your organization is, who is going to target you. And this is where those identifying the adversary comes in. So if you're worried about a specific threat actor, a whether it's, you know, APT-19 or a specific type of ransomware, then you gather threat intelligence about that. So that can be anything from behaviors, public reporting, maybe it's a, a couple of virus total samples that you can dig through, again, depending on the, the skill sets of your team, and then pull out those TTPs. You know, MITRE ATT&CK is a really, really nice framework that lots of examples, lots of references on things that have been extracted. So uh, I always point people to that as sort of a uh, as a foundational way to do it. And then as you mature, you can sort of figure out what works best for you and your team and your organization. And so uh, basically, once that's done, you can analyze, organize all of those into, you know, an adversary methodology. So does the adversary do uh, privilege escalation before they do lateral movement, vice versa? Do they try and cover their tracks? You know, for instance, with some of the solar winds, um, malware, it was very adamant about trying to figure out what, whether it would trigger defensive mechanisms before deploying more techniques. So those are the types of things that you need to understand when you're trying to emulate these threats. And so there you create a plan and then at the end you have this adversary emulation. And so whether it's, you know, you've got your TTPs in an Excel spreadsheet, or if you have them, uh, in a tool, for instance, that's going to be that's going to be depending on what you what you're trying to do with that uh, emulation plan. So there's different, you know, I've talked about TTPs. So so what are we talking about? And so a lot of you might be familiar with this. I think it's a really awesome graphic. David Bianco from Microsoft. Uh, it's his pyramid of pain. And so adversary pain. And so there's a couple different ways to look at this. If you're a defender, you have like hash values are super easy. Uh, to sort of plug in and say, this is a bad hash. Um, and you can sort of work your way up with the difficulty in trying to uh, build detections around specific things. And so from a you know red teaming and testing standpoint too, like hash values are trivial to change. You can recompile the code, especially if you have access. Um, IP addresses, domain names, network artifacts. Those are things that, especially with the cloud and some of the provisioning and uh, automation orchestration technologies today are super easy to spin up new instances, to uh, change IP addresses, domain names, things like that. And that's where when you start getting to host artifacts and tools, it, it gets more difficult to retool, for instance. And that's where, uh, and also when it gets to TTPs, if adversaries, you know, they're, they're people like you and me. And so they have deadlines, they have expertise that they have to leverage, things like that. So that's something to keep in mind is 
the, the higher you are able to rate detections and sort of build the maturity of your own defensive team, the more difficult it is going to be for adversaries to pivot, to uh, build new capability because they also need experts in this space to do something for them. So it's just, uh, you know, two different ways of looking at the pyramid of pain here. Uh, and, and overall though, you know, the, it can really help the maturity of some of your different detections, depending on uh, what part of this they can detect. So how do you extract TTPs from a threat intelligence report? So this is a FireEye uh, report that was screenshotted, and this is um, a credit to Katie and Cody for, again, creating this uh, as well. And so this is pulling out all the different techniques as related to MITRE attack from that specific uh, from that specific report, or at least this paragraph of the report. So I will say MITRE does have a free training on using attack on their uh, on their website. So if you're not familiar with attack at all, it takes a couple hours to go through, but it is about essentially doing and understanding this process is going through those reports, extracting those TTPs. And if nothing else, it's so that you can understand some of the pain that analysts have to go through when they are trying to uh, identify what TTPs are in it. So once you've extracted all those TTPs, uh, you know, you have a, your nice list of numbers, maybe use Excel or something else. Uh, and Attack Navigator is a really nice way, especially from when we're doing uh, adversary emulation to show just what is our general coverage. And so you can sort of uh, use this to either communicate to people that have seen attack before uh, or just sort of show a trend. Uh, you can look and this adversary has a couple different things uh, spread out across a couple of tactics where some adversaries, for instance, might have super deep knowledge in discovery and defense evasion and things like that. And so that provides you that uh, some additional information into uh, what is that adversary's methodology? What do they seem to do? And maybe you can identify or prioritize specific tactics that adversaries are uh, seem to be leaning heavily on, for instance, discovery. Even if you haven't seen them do a specific technique, for instance, you may know that, well, in order for this adversary to determine more about my file system, they're gonna have to run this command. And even though it hasn't been reported in threat intelligence, uh, you have to remember, cyber threat intelligence is all historic data. It's things that have been reported, uh, things that have been seen, but depending on the reporting, uh, as we'll show an example in the lab, it might be uh, it might be a bit later, you know, it might be three or four years old, has the adversary stopped operating or have they adjusted their tactics and that just hasn't quite made it into attack yet. So that's something to sort of keep in mind. Uh, you know, I like to call that sort of adaptive emulation, uh, but that's, that's where trying to understand once you have built detections around what the cyber threat intelligence says about your current adversary, how are they going to change? Right, Emotet and a couple of those other ransomware authors have been adapting uh, their techniques over the years. And so, if you go and look at Emotet from twenty, I think fourteen, all the way to this year and last year, they have made some significant retooling and changes over the years. And so, that's something that's really important to know: is that just because you've you know solved something once, doesn't mean that you're going to detect it for all time because the techniques do change. Operating systems change, right? Trying to build a detection for Windows 7 versus Windows 10 is going to be a little bit different. So once you have all these techniques, this is how George and I like to outline things when we are going through a purple team exercise. We have the tactic on the left, uh, and then we have a description of the adversary, overall what their objectives are, and then technique ID. So I'll go to the, uh, just to give you a quick highlight, we, we do release free threats. George and I and, and other members of the site team have all worked. We've built out threats. We build them in uh, for Scythe, but you can leverage the emulation plans and anything like that uh, outside of it. We, we have a nice blog post on each one. We sort of outline what the threat is, where we got the threat intelligence, things like that, and then how to emulate and uh, defend against the adversaries. So, so these are all available for free. You could go read them on our site. Uh, so 
and you can see the links here. So, and then we've released all of the associated JSON on our uh, community GitHub. So just wanna highlight that and then sort of go back to, this is what a filled out version of that first table would look like. So uh, this is Orange Worm. And so it's, it's a group that's targeted healthcare uh, organizations. And so that's where we get that nice description. And also this one happens to sort of bake in, you know, what their goal is as well. Uh, it's corporate espionage, just in case the text is too small. Uh, but, but sometimes, you know, that's going to be important for what is the impact the adversary is going for. Sometimes they are going for, you know, ransomware is obviously trying to spread and lock down systems and, and make some money where if something, if there's a uh, adversary that's going for IP stealing and things like that, they're obviously going to be more focused on sort of doing discovery and collection of information. So oftentimes there are trends between between those, and that's just something that's sometimes why we break out uh, description and uh, also have a sort of what's the intent of the adversary uh, can be separate. So again, it depends as you all do these things in an organization, uh, you will find out what is what are the things we care about most and sort of build out uh, you know your your reporting to match that. So logistics, these are always a concern uh, with purple teaming. Obviously, in COVID times, this is where uh, we've done we've done a lot of remote. Well, we've done at least all remote that I've I've been aware of. Uh, remote purple teams. So this has been you know really good from a it's it still worked really well. We've gotten uh, multiple teams all on Zoom calls like this one and and sort of hash things out we'll we you know everyone swaps sharing their screens and things like that of course making sure that you know you can uh see all of the detections that are necessary and it's it's worked really well so sometimes if you have to travel that's of course going to be a uh, part of your planning and in general just trying to figure out what what do we need to, to make this this uh exercise work and so whether you need to arrive a day early um, setting up that that's why you know sometimes especially in person you might need that first week if it's a multi-week purple team exercise maybe really focused on that initial connectivity depending on what sign offs and things have happened so plus you know i think anybody that's run any exercise purple red anything can tell you that what you expect to happen on that initial execution what does rarely matches up the first time so just something to uh to keep in mind Target systems. So you should test in production. I know that's the, you know, from anyone that has development backgrounds, you know, don't test in production. Uh, but from a security standpoint, production is where all of your defensive systems, that is where they're all deployed, is where they are all tuned to. And so the issue becomes that uh, you have, if trying to do a very specific uh, testing in a, in a test system, I've yet to to see anyone that has had pretty much a perfect replica of their production system also in a test system. And so it really comes down to one or two things. You can overtune the detections in the test system so much so that it's shooting fish in a barrel. And it's it's super easy for the blue team to pick out everything su like super quickly and be like, yeah, we'd, we'd see that in three seconds. Uh, when if you mix that in with all of the uh, the things that happen in a normal environment, whether it's system uh, administrator activities, uh, some of these new automation and provisioning tools use like uh, use a lot of encoded PowerShell when they are provisioning stuff across the network. So that's something that surprises a lot of folks if they turn on PowerShell monitoring, for instance. And so that's the kind of noise that really a purple team helps build out is understanding what is that tuning what things are in your environment you know that are doing alert that are alerting uh just by default and then how do we make that something that is going to be a really uh a really good alert so that it has minimum false positive things like that so and that's goes back to that retesting i talked about so um you know this just sort of outlines ideally uh 
having a host and a server, uh, we've run into organizations that that do log those differently and also alert on them differently. So they had uh, better protections, for instance, or a very specific product for their servers, and then the endpoints were a little different. So that's where instead of just testing, uh, you know, for instance, uh, we tested uh, Maze is one thing that we've that we've tested before, and then uh, Ryuk, and so testing both of those on as many different endpoints as possible. Uh, Linux, Mac is great as well, just because each of those systems requires a little bit of different logging, a little bit of different alerting. And so trying to figure out exactly where your gaps are, it's you got to hit as much coverage as possible. So this is something that you as the testers want to know, what are the tools that are in installed. This is both from a, are they going to cause issues with that initial execution, but also where should we, where should each team be looking for detections? So especially again, as you get into large enterprises, you're going to have uh, potentially multiple tools that either are sending conflicting reports or, you know, fighting each other essentially. Uh, and so we've seen uh, teams that, you know, have pretty good coverage of all of their different tools, but also they've liked to stick to one or two specific tools that, that they had people that had really good expertise in, but the challenge was that maybe those tools didn't get information as fast as the other one. And so that's where you have, uh, you know, if you have something that's, that's logging, uh, directly to, you know, your, your Splunk instance, for instance, uh, versus going through a couple of forwarders, that's kind of stuff to understand. Uh, the architecture of those because it can impact your detection times and, for instance, any alerts that might pop through. So preparation for, for any exercises, you are going to want to make sure that your SOC and HUNT team are both that are prepared. Uh, so just so they know that you know, this is going to be a test. I know sometimes there are uh, red team tests, for instance, that are done with no prep and no warning specifically to emulate in, in a real adversary and the test response times of blue team down to, you know, if they have to work 24 hours to get through something that's, uh, you know, I, I know I've, I've read stories, I think of Facebook and a few others doing uh, exercises like that. So you can do those types of things with purple teaming. But we, you know, the way we sort of outlined it in the exercise that this is a, this is a full knowledge um, test. And part of it is making sure everyone is in the same room and on the same page. And so oftentimes this exercise may be the first time that some of those teams are actively working together. So this is just, uh, you know, again, sort of outlining, making sure that you do notify the right teams and you understand what processes are supposed to happen. So oftentimes an exercise can uh, identify and, and very much show where there is a lack of process that there should be one. And so that's something just to keep in mind is that how are you expecting to get information and are there techniques that may interfere with that uh, information gathering. So if something turns off Sysmon or something like that, is that something that you can detect? And so sort of the integrity of your own uh, defensive tools is really important to also test. So then uh, as far as once everyone's prepped, everyone's ready, you kick off the exercise and it's it sort of can be, uh, it can be a little slow just as in, it's very deliberate. So I, I keep using that word, you know, deliberate red team is, is something I said earlier. And part of that is because it, that is what purple teaming and some of that is. It's not a, we're going to run through a bunch of tests and, and, you know, we'll, we'll print out a report. It's a very much a executing, maybe a single technique, maybe a series of techniques, and then understanding what is supposed to happen with each of those techniques. What are the artifacts that each of those techniques left, whether it's in a command line log, whether it's a uh, leverage PowerShell or the win uh, called win APIs directly. Those are all different touch points in an operating system that a team needs to understand what their, uh, what their vision into it is. So that's sort of just, uh, it's a, you know, going with the flow. And so this is just outlining basically exactly what I said. 
Uh, you're, we're kicking off a uh, technique and then asking the appropriate teams based on that question before, what is supposed to happen? Uh, and if, if that isn't what happened, then finding out the difference. There's some investigation. This is why, this is why these things take time. You can do a two hour test, but you know, that's, that's again, questions and comments that we've gotten through purple teaming is, well, what if we get done early? What if we, uh, what if we're able to get through all of the techniques and things like that? But because uh, a big focus is on detecting those behaviors and the different execution methods that adversaries can leverage, each technique is not necessarily, oh, we ran it, oh, we caught it, okay, or, oh, you didn't catch it, then we just move on. It's understanding that entire process. How do we build a detection for this? And maybe the information is not even logged. So then you have to figure out how do we want to log this? And that, again, that involves processes, that involves people. You know, is there a new technology that can be deployed or is this something that could be leveraged? You could leverage Sysmon or something like that. So those are all really specific choices that are going to be different per organization. And that's why these things take time. So just want to sort of continue to reinforce that, that this is a very collaborative effort. Um, and it's a very, again, I'll, I like using the word deliberate because it is a very focused execution of each technique. So I mentioned before, sharing the screen, if it's identified, you know, I think, you know, everyone on here that's a blue teamer probably has their like 30 different uh, Splunk tabs. You know, I think that's, uh, I, I think I've yet to see a screen that didn't have at least that many. Uh, you know, with the different searches, searches and dashboards. And so demonstrating those is really important and showing members to your team. This is where we talked about training. And so having your principal or, or senior uh, threat hunters or walking through how they detected this is also an education opportunity for those uh, other SOC members that may not have that expertise now or are trying to learn. So that's where we say that purple teaming can help train uh, train new people, can train people on your processes, and it can be on how are we supposed to investigate these? Who should it go to next? And so all of those things are outlined here. And so you document it. And so this is a screenshot of one of the tools that we integrate with called Vector, which you'll also get to play with in the lab. So Vector has a, it, you can import what you've done uh, on the site side of things, which you'll see. And then you see on the right side, I'm not gonna, uh, not gonna try and zoom in on all of these, but basically it has the blue team details. Was this detected? Was it blocked? Was, it a, was there logs that even captured the information in the first place? Because if you don't get the information, can't alert on it. So all of these things require some documentation. That's where we have like the, uh, the exercise coordinator roles in those roles and responsibilities is who's going through and taking these notes. And so obviously if you don't use something like Scythe, then for the red team details, you're potentially gonna have to fill those out. So we did try and, you know, take away at least half of the work here and make it so that the focus can be on building out better detections and that detection engineering I've continued to highlight. So at the very end, uh, lessons learned are really important. You know, going through that uh, improvement that, uh, going through that improvement I've talked about at the very beginning in our case study, right? How, why has purple teaming helped the exercise, uh, the organization? How is the exercise, what has been gained through it? Whether it's new detections that were written, gaps that were previously unknown, new metrics, for instance, for the teams to, to build toward from a, uh, we want to get detections down to five minutes, right? Instead of two hours or 10 hours or something like that. Those, all those lessons learned need to be captured uh, because that is a, a big part of purple teaming and, and sort of I'll, I'll say some of the differences, at least with my experience with red teaming, has been writing a report afterward and sort of sharing that. And part of the purple team is that easy to see return on investment. Here's what was done. Here's what was emulated. And not just that, here are the detections. Uh, here's how the organization is already safer from what we've done in the purple team. 
So, uh, you know, good red teams will, will, uh, are, are worth their weight in gold. I will, I will say, so I don't want anybody to think that I'm, uh, by any means saying that that red teams uh, don't bring a lot of value, but I, I do think that there is often challenges with uh, the communications between when a red team comes in and the blue team that they're trying to test. So when using uh, different tools, you know, I've highlighted Scythe. Uh, we have uh, Scythe also contributes to the C2 matrix, which helps identify all the different command and control frameworks, uh, post-exploitation ones that have been created by researchers uh, and, and companies, things like that, and highlights the different uh, things that it can do from a command and control, whether it has a UI, multi-user, all those things. Uh, I'd highly recommend you check it out just because it's really interesting to see all the design choices that people have made. Uh, so it's, an, it's a neat, uh, it's a really cool Google sheet and I've used it a couple of times. You can go and, you know, make a copy, clear out a couple of rows to, to do some nice comparisons and, and show those. So now uh, last, last pitch here is, is on just the site tool that you're about to dive into the lab for. So we are an enterprise grade platform for adversary emulation. Uh, we do create, you know, what we like to call synthetic malware. So essentially, while it is emulating TTPs, it isn't going to damage your system. We are doing things, for instance, uh, if we were testing a scheduled task uh, creation and, you know, like a lot of adversaries do for either persistence, uh, for uh, elevation, things like that, we would create a, uh, a scheduled task. And then after we run something, it does something completely benign, and then it, we would clean up and delete it. And so part of that is, as I mentioned before, we want those artifacts in, in the logs. We want those things that command creation, that execution, and then that deletion uh, are, you know, it, it works well from a cleanup perspective, but also adversaries are trying to cover their tracks at times. So we're trying to test all of those things. All of those events are created. And, and so that's done in sort of an automated fashion. And so that's where we're trying to do this. And, and so that's one example. And so we can be deployed on-prem. That's something you have. You don't need any connection to the cloud for uh, people that, for instance, don't want something else beaconing back to the cloud. Uh, and so that's, that's something that um, I really like about, about our tool is that it can be spun up, uh, tore down, that kind of things, no problem. And you can enter emulate all these known threat actors that I mentioned in Threat Thursday. I forget what our official count is. George, if you've got it, you know, jump on and, and yell. But I think it's over 20 or 30 threats now. And I, what's that? Something like that. I, it's over 20 for sure. Yeah. And so we are continuing to build those every month. And so part of what, part of us building those threats in Threat Thursday is that we listen to our customers. What, who are they concerned about? You, you know, obviously you'll see uh, some of the threats that we have are, a lot of them are ransomware related. Everybody cares about ransomware. So that's just something to, to keep in mind the, that, you know, if, if you become a site customer and you have a specific threat you'd like us to develop, let us know. So this is just a huge list of the features and capabilities. You'll get to sort of see our nice uh, GUI that where you can build all this stuff, you know, with two or three clicks. I do want to highlight uh, on the bottom right there, the integrations. So there's Plex Track, which is essentially a, a, a similar, uh, it's a report that and uh, recording of uh, purple team exercises essentially. And so this is where you can import uh, again, those scythe results after you've run a test and then go through and click, uh, you know, whether select whether something was detected, whether it was logged and you can, uh, assign it to different people, things like that. Uh, we do integrate with uh, different teams. And so Splunk is obviously a, one that's we're a huge user uh, are all of our customers. And so any but anything that takes syslog, uh, we are able to pipe the output of attacks to. Uh, and so we also, you know, I've mentioned Red Canary's Atomic Red Team, which is obviously a fantastic framework. Uh, you know, we're big fans of Red Canary. Uh, and in fact, one of, uh, one of our, uh, former Scythe, uh, employees actually just went and, uh, took a position there. So Adam is, 
uh, the director, I think, of their open source tooling. And so uh, we have integration with them. We can do all of Atomic uh, Red Team, and you can build that out. And then Vector, as you'll see, is, again, that tracking and showing value uh, similar to PlexTrack. So I'm not going to dive into the, this too much because I want you all to go and see it firsthand. And I will be walking through it. So if you just want to sit back and relax and, and watch me run through uh, the lab, then that's fine too. So we're going to jump into hands-on time. So, and let's see, I think it looks like George and people have answered every question so far. We're trying. <laughs> Um, one thing I did want to add, um, and a lot of folks like uh, the free resources, a few that we've added here um, are Unicon on April 9th is going to be a free half day conference. Uh, we haven't officially announced, so you get to hear it here first that Dave Kennedy will be our keynote speaker. Um, he is an investor and advisor of Scythe and of course runs Trusted Sex and, and Binary Defense. Um, so we're excited and, uh, yeah, sh should be fun. Um, now I don't know how long this is actually going to take for you, Tim, because you didn't click on the link earlier and we did pre-provision some folks. Um, you can take my link though here. Let me chat this over to you. Oh, it worked. It's oh, it's yeah. right. As I stopped sharing, it was like, here you go. Awesome. Yeah, no, we pre, we pre-provisioned 350 uh, accounts, so have fun. All right. So, uh, all right, and I think we're good. So, uh, this is this is what you should see uh, in your VMware learning platform. So it's got this uh, really nice uh, setup, and so basically, I'm going to walk through everything. It'll probably take. 15, 20 minutes for me to do this. Again, if you're comfortable with this and you want to explore, you know, throw me on mute and uh, and go to town. Uh, but basically, I'm going to walk through this and then I will be around till the end of the workshop uh, answering any questions and, and uh, things like that. So first thing I want to do is, you know, your life raft here. If you ever forget username and passwords, it's notes here at the top. You can click it doesn't matter what screen you're on and it will show you username and password for both the unicorn uh, unicorn console as well as scythe and vector credentials. So if you click on the left here, for those of you that haven't used it, you can see your different consoles and you can click between the sand slingshot that we talked about that has all those different C2 ones and then unicorn is where your scythe instance is. So you've got a manual here on the right which has a little bit of things, a uh, little bit of an intro. I'm not gonna read through all of it. Uh, so I'm gonna let you all spend some time doing that. So I'm just gonna walk through some general stuff. Um, and then, and so you can click up here, you can either click the arrow to the right, this blue arrow, which will move you between each one, or you can click at the top, uh, you can click all the numbers. So just in case you haven't used VMware Learning Platform, I know it was new to me, uh until i joined scythe so but it's actually been really really cool so we'll go ahead and hit control delete and i think our first thing is to log in all right so yeah so we're going to log in first Let's see if i can type this in correctly all right and so once you're logged in you can just click on the google chrome and it's going maybe, to... maybe show folks because uh, a couple of people had problems how to change the resolution right in that VM, uh, just right clicking in the desktop itself and uh, choosing display settings and then making it a, li a little bigger just so things look better. Yep. Sorry, here. I'm, uh, yeah, I, there we go. Right click display settings. All right. So this is where you can go down choose your resolution. You can see mine is, uh, is pretty small and you can jump it up. So that uh, I'll, sh I'll show you and mentioned in the, if you're still working on the smaller uh, resolution screen, just where some of the scythe menus, uh, it gives you one of those little uh, hamburger menus that you can click out that'll still pop out. 
So that is one way to do it. You can bump up your resolution here just by right clicking on the desktop. And so also, if you want to get rid of it, you can click manual and it'll hide back and then you can start dragging this uh, to resize things as well. So got a couple different options. I'm working off of a, you know, 13 inch Mac here. So um, that's why I'm not working off of some massive desktop or anything. So hopefully uh, you should be able to work off anything. Although I'm not sure we've had success with an iPad yet. I haven't tried. So, uh, so once you click this, uh, we don't have, you know, signed certificate uh, in, in the lab. So you'll have to, you know, go uh, hit, go to advance and then proceed to scythe and you'll get this nice warning and then you'll get your login. So this is again, if you get here, say your manual is back here. So you don't have that username and password again, click notes. It's right here. So we'll go ahead and log in. And I am going to have the manual up because I am just going to follow along. So what we're going to do is we have the campaign manager. So again, I'm going to, let me see if I can shrink this enough to show you all if it reduces it. Uh, yep. All right. So if it is shrunk and you get this little, these, uh, you know, three bars, the hamburger uh, menu, then you can click that and it will pop out. So depending on the size of your screen, uh, you may have that happen. And so you can open and close uh, different menus to sort of get things working. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to click new campaign. And so this, that was the initial dashboard interface. So if you're running a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different uh, like ransomware campaigns, things like that, you can, it has some nice, like how many techniques were executed and you can sort of see if you're running multiple campaigns, uh, different stats. So we are then going to, we have to create a name. This is one of the, the big things you have to do is, is come up with your very creative first campaign name. So I'm going to talk through, you know, really quickly a couple of these features just so you can see uh, see what, what Scythe is, and then you can go and play around with it. So we do have Mac and Linux payloads. Uh, the restrict campaign is something, at least with these execution guardrails, is limited to Windows. And so you can either uh, set a device name or a domain name uh, to restrict the uh, running. This is sometimes more done for like red teams, for instance, because uh, in a purple team campaign, most of the times you're going to be focused on maybe a, a single or a few different um, hosts. So you don't necessarily need to restrict it because, you know, at least most of our purple teams, we don't uh, we don't do and focus on lateral movement because most folks don't uh, have all the detections down for the host yet. And so if you're relying on catching lateral movement, uh, that's, you know, that's a lot of times after an adversary has already done something. So we like to focus on the host first. You can do a start and end date. Again, it's optional. And then let me make sure I'm following my, uh, my own uh, guide here. And so we're going to leave all those things. We're going to leave HTTPS as our, and we can scroll down. And so the cool thing here is you have all these parameters. So this is this, uh, CP is campaign platform. So you need to map, make sure, I mean, this does match by default because everyone's provisioned the same image, but you need to make sure that this matches up here. So if you have your own site server, uh, that's sort of important. So if you do want to change things, however, uh, let's see, we're going to go down, we're going to change heartbeat to 10. So the way to change things is you can either go and type, type something out, or you can just click on this parameter and then type in 10. And there we go. So simple enough. Uh, it's meant to be meant to be pretty intuitive. Uh, so if there are things that you know you don't find super intuitive, let us know. Always happy to get feedback. And going once we're down here, I think the main thing next is the capability modules. These are shown on the next page in a little better detail. Um, but this is just if you want to, you know, get something going quickly. So loader and controller, I think, are the only two that are supposed to be loaded. And yep, so we are good to go. So let me close this. 
And then we're going to scroll all the way down to the end. So this is uh, some signature avoidance. You can click randomize if you want to change compilation timestamps uh, or the program uh, database path. So these things you can, if you want, like some malware has specific PDBs or specific times that they were compiled. Uh, you can also you know, type in your own. So depending on the type of emulation you're going for, the main thing here is that you know we don't want people writing a very uh, writing a detection on something that was only compiled at this time and that's it. So uh, you know behavior. So this is this is where you can randomize to get around some initial signature stuff. So we'll click next, and then when you click next, you're gonna have to scroll up. So cool thing about Scythe, it is an enterprise grade platform uh, or C2. So if you went and clicked, you know go from here if we go all the way to the bottom and click next and then ran this you would you would basically get a shell this start and finish is is going to just have a shell that you can run commands on you can load any of these actions in uh, but part of what we are doing here is we are trying to demonstrate some automation so i'm going to expand this some give me a little bit more room to work uh, and i think what we're going to do so let's read ahead a little bit so we're going to uh, load some modules and then execute some actions. All right. So ARP, print screen, and run. So what I'm going to do is click ARP. We're going to click, we'll scroll down, run, and print screen. So the way Scythe works is it's got a little bit of its own language here. And so whenever you load something, this is not actually running anything. You know, this is if if this menu here is your armory here on the left of all the things you could do, uh, then you have on the right side when you load it, you're putting in your backpack, right? This is your, something you're taking with you on your adventure. And so if you actually want to execute it, though, you go down here and you have to click. Uh, you can click and, you know, ARP and I'll scroll back up to show you in a minute. Run. And then let's see print screen. So now we can go, go up and see ARP, run, who am I? So all these, you'll notice they're tagged with attack techniques. If we click on them, it'll take us to the attack page so you can read more about it. So for instance, you know, say you're not an attack expert, which is completely fine, and you're clicking around, you want to know a little bit more about what you were thinking about testing. There it is. So you can also create your own custom techniques. Uh, and I'll show a little bit more of attack integration here in a minute. Um, but also just trying to highlight a couple of things. So the Python 3 runtime, uh, that is something that uh, we are able to load regardless of whether it's uh, Mac, Windows, or Linux. So as far as extending site, this is something that would obviously wouldn't do during this uh, workshop, but just sort of highlighting what we can do. If you wanted to extend Scythe and run some Python modules you had written in memory, uh, that's that's all available. So we're gonna, let's see, next, we're gonna do a MITRE ATT&CK technique, and then we're gonna finish it. So we're gonna go down here. You can run custom actions, You can, and then you can also do compound actions. So we'll come back and show existing threats in a little bit, but so I clicked MITRE ATT&CK technique, and we see, okay, we have the attack matrix. And so I mentioned before, that we integrate with Red Canary. So anything you can click on here, you can add. I'm gonna scroll down uh, because there's a lot of attack uh, tech tactics uh, and my browser doesn't, you know, scroll, doesn't have a huge scroll, right? Basically uh, it puts them all at the end of these. So that's where we'll go, let's do system service discovery. And so now I can select which atomic red team I wanna use. This is one that uh, it shows different uh, different execution methods. So some of them, for instance, will show PowerShell versus or, and let me see if I can find one of those. Let's see. Uh, so this is where I mentioned before, uh, different detections based on whether you're running command line or PowerShell. Here we go. All right, so we have a couple of different techniques uh, that we can run, we can list egress ports. So this is this is all different things you can do with Scythe. 
uh, I'm just going to pick this one to keep keep rolling and hit add steps. And so if we go back, we can see everything's been tagged over here with Atomic. And that's how you know that you are leveraging Atomic Red Team. So also tagged with attack techniques. And basically, it's a chain of a couple of different things that are all going to run. Uh, and I think at this point, so say we've created this sort of, it's a custom threat. It, it doesn't necessarily have a name, but we are still going to save it. And so, because we're going to want to run this again. So basically, we're going to save steps as threat. And we're going to call it first threat. All right. And then I'm going to save. Set threat save successfully. And so now, uh, now I think we're going to start it. And then I can show you. All right. And so, yep, we're going to click next. And then we're going to deliver the campaign. All right. So at this this window, this is where uh, you can see there's a couple things that are being deprecated, but that's because how we're starting. So physical is the most common, especially with the purple team exercises, because this is where you can either we're going to download it, I believe, or you can, for instance, you have direct download links where you can send these links to someone specifically if you say we want, you know, we're running Scythe, we want your part of the organization to run this test. So here's the link, download and execute this, you know, that that can be sort of the kickoff point. So again, I have to make sure I'm following my own directions. So what we're going to do is download the 64-bit EXE. And so we will hit download, 64-bit EXE, download. All right. So we got our first download. So once we're once it's downloaded, we are going to click it. And it has. I think it's mark of the web. So we're just going to say, yep, we're good. And I'm going to close this. We're going to wait. And there we go. Now we have an active device name. So if we click on our campaign, threat status is running. And so as things happen, you will see that it's going to execute those commands. So just a quick reminder that we set the heartbeat at 10. So that means it's going to be a 10 second inter, uh, intervals that's going to uh, call back. So you can set that to either smaller or larger. And you can also, for those of you that are familiar with tools like Cobalt Strike, you can introduce jitter. So that's something to, you know, you can, from a network uh, command and control defense and detection perspective, if you're if you have alerts that trigger if something calls out at exactly the same amount of time in between uh, packets, then that would be where you would want to introduce jitter to help test whether or not you could, if something is going to call back every eight to 12 seconds randomly. And so jitter is meant to sort of try and uh, get around some of those initial detections. And so these are all things that you can test easily within the platform. As you can see, everything is continuing to run. And so as that's running, we'll go ahead and let's see what we're going to do it next. So we've watched the automation. Oh, and then I talked before about, say you just run with no steps or even afterward, you can just click this nice little shell and now you have a shell. And so you can type help and it'll give you, a, you know, I mentioned site does have its own language, but you can just run, you can use run and, uh, uh, PowerShell, and you can execute anything that you would normally execute through the command line. So, you know, part of part of what we, uh, part of why Scythe, I think, is is a cool tool is not just the uh, the shell aspect, but I like automation and being able to, you know, hand over a test that we've done so that people can run it over and over again and continue to build off of it. So I think that's sort of a, a really important point to adversary emulation tools is that uh, repeatability. So with that, I think it's done. I think the next part is we're gonna go to reports. So we have campaign manager here. I'm gonna move that up just to, and we're going to go to the report section. So in reports, you can see 
uh, what the campaigns you've run and see there was a couple others that have been run uh, before. And so first campaign is our own. This is how many uh, steps were run and then our events and then our traffic between the two if you're trying to correlate network logs, for instance, and uh, NetFlow logs. So we have, I'll, I'll show a couple different ones here. Uh, and so this is just going through it. Click CSV because you're going to want to download that for later. We're going to use that with vector. Uh, we can also click HTML this will, and then click on it. This gives you a breakdown of exactly what was run, timestamps, commands, output, all of that. This is the print screen. So this is what my desktop looks like. And so go ahead and close that. And then so something cool that we have is executive summary. So uh, a lot of times people will have their own, they'll use Scythe as part of their own sort of reporting and testing. And so what you can do is, I mean, we have, you can replace the Scythe logo with your own, for instance, if you wanted. And, but this executive summary is meant to be uh, sort of just that you can copy and paste it in a report type thing. So this is the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain that I talked about earlier. And I mentioned, right, command and control and actions on objectives are sort of the main things that we're testing. Specifically, this test uh, leveraged actions on objectives. So that's why uh, we have, you know, we have impact ratings, we have what the campaign did. This is all, like I said, copy pasteable. So it's a nice way to at least kick off a report if you don't have anything. And then, of course, we have our MITRE attack reporting. So this is, so let me just to free up some more space. This it shows, uh, this is an inbuilt, shows what was executed and what wasn't. Red means it executed successfully. Anything that is blue, just to pull it down and see the legend, uh, means that it was either prevented or the execution failed. And so uh, most of the time that's, you know, if something was prevented, so that is a good thing. If something uh, was detected, that's again, that's going to be something that uh, we'll show with like vector. And then uh, we do have a, uh, you can download attack navigator JSON. And then there's also a NIST uh, 800 MITRE released a map to NIST 800. Uh, and so we have also a mapping to that for those of you that leverage that in your organizations. So let's see what we're doing next. So now that we've gone uh, gone through all of that, we are moving on. So detection with Wireshark. So this is just to show the connection between the command and control. So I'm just gonna jump over this. Uh, that way you all can, can get into the lab if you'd like. It basically is showing the communication between the server and that Scythe executable. Uh, all of our traffic is encrypted because we chose HTTPS. Um, but for instance, say you needed to run it through, uh, if, if your organization or whoever's testing does SSL interception, we do have HTTP payloads, although our, the information is still encrypted uh, so that it won't be easily picked up uh, just by someone monitoring for text. That being said, you know, you could write a high entropy detection uh, for SSL interception uh, to detect encrypted comms that are going out through HTTP. And that would be, of course, one way to detect site. So, uh, so again, I'm gonna jump over this Wireshark part uh, just to, again, sort of uh, keep going on, this, on the site portion and so you all can uh, jump into the labs if you're uh, following along with me. So I mentioned before that oftentimes there's going to be reporting that isn't complete necessarily. And so if we look at like Orange Worm, uh, as if we click on them, we should we see, okay, it's a pretty light group. And then we have two techniques used. So that's kind of interesting because especially if we look at all of these different software that they they leverage, you would think it's probably going to be more. Uh, and so that's this happens. And oftentimes, I mean, if you're if you're really trying to dive into what Orange Worm does, you can leverage both of these to get uh, and some of the reports and references to get a good idea of what Orange Worm actually does. And so what we're going to do 
is we're going to import orange worm as a threat. So let's see, you can either go through, read the report yourself, extract those TTPs, uh, like in the screenshot for the FireEye report uh, that, that I referenced in our talk earlier, or you can trust, uh, I think George's handiwork here. Uh, yep. So this is our, our Scythe uh, Threat Thursday on Orange Worm. So you can go and read through it. As you can see, it's pretty long. George goes into detail about this stuff. I mean, George, George is awesome. So he's been doing this a while. So I encourage you to go read through that if you'd like. Um, but basically what George did is he, he mapped out those techniques into Scythe and made it available. So what we're gonna do is we are going to import that. So you can either go through it and um, read through those techniques yourself. You can put it, uh, put it on the back burner for later after this class as far as mapping those, because that's a, a little bit different than what we're going over. But um, you can go to the community threat GitHub and sort of see it. We already downloaded it on the VMs for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down here to threat manager and we're going to go to migrate threats. And so at the top of that page, so I'm going to remove the manual real quick. I'm going to choose a file to import. And then we're in downloads. And we can see that we have orange worm underscore scythe underscore threat dot JSON. So we're going to open it up and hit import. All right, it's done. And that is, that is what George and I hope to achieve every Threat Thursday we release is that it is that easy. And so now you can go and click into the threat catalog. And so for instance, uh, you can see all the different threats that we already have in here. Um, you can see the first threat, what you, if uh, the one that you saved from our first campaign, those steps as a threat, you don't necessarily have to save it, but if for repeat, repeat, uh, repeatability, it's always good. And then we can go down here and we can see orange room. So um, let's see. So next we are going to create a new campaign leveraging our newly created, our newly imported orange worm threat. So we're gonna go in here, we're gonna call it orange worm, very creative. And so we're not gonna restrict anything. I think we are just gonna roll. Let me double check that I'm following the same things that you all are meant to do. And yep, I think we're good. So we'll scroll all the way to the bottom. We'll hit next. And so then we'll scroll up. And so this is where next to compound actions, the MITRE attack techniques you can see existing threats. And so now we can go and we can pick any of the threats we've done before an orange worm and hit add steps. And so in like, I don't know, 20 seconds, we went from zero and one to now we have a, how many steps is this one? 31 steps. And so this is where you can either, you can change things if you want. Say you wanna run, run these in reverse order. You can drag and drop these around. And so that's, again, these are all tagged. And instead of needing to save these steps as a threat because we haven't made any changes, we're just gonna hit next. And then we're gonna hit start campaign. And so this time, instead of using the EXE, we are going to download the 32-bit DLL. So I'm gonna go 32-bit DLL. We're gonna leave this entry point function name. This is something that if you wanna change this, um, that's, that's great. Um, but if you're not quite sure what this is, it's completely okay. The only thing is just remember what it is because we're gonna type it in in a minute. And so we'll hit download. So Google and everyone doesn't like you downloading DLLs. And so you have to hit keep and then what we're going to do is so we will open command prompt, which is just here in the bottom left. We are going to check what directory we're in. We're not in download, so we're gonna move there. And then we're going to execute our 
and I'm just going to copy and paste this. See if it, see how well it works. All right. Oh. So run dll32.exe. Then we have orange worm. We can auto complete that at least with a tab. And then no spaces, that is key, comma, and then that platform client main that I told you to remember. And so we execute that. We get a little uh, little circle knowing that something's running. And we can go back to Scythe, click done, move a couple of these windows out of the way. And we see again, now we've executed and Orange Worm is operating. So now this is, this is where we get into the detection side of things where uh, you can uh, work with Sysmon. And so that's where we can enable Sysmon. And part of what we're gonna do is go through leverage uh, Olaf uh, Hartong's uh, Sysmon modular. Uh, and that was, that was uh, one of the other big ones was Swift on Securities Sysmon configuration. So really, really nice open source like information on doing detections with Sysmon. So let's see. So I, this is all of these instructions are pretty clear and we're, we're coming up at halfway through. So I don't want to dive into too much of this stuff um, that you all can spend some time in. And if you get confused and if there are specific steps that people are having trouble with, I will then go and demo some of this. So I just want to get you all into, uh, into the labs if you haven't already. And so this is where, again, after you enable Sysmon, you execute the orange worm campaign again so that you can see uh, and you can literally just either run the same DLL or you can download an executable and continue to run this just to double check stuff. So we do have another emulation here that we can do. This one takes like, I think 15 minutes to run total, uh, partially because it's gathering some domain information and stuff like that. We have a small domain, so we've sort of made it uh, that 15 minutes is the short option. So again, I'm gonna let you all discover some of this. I do wanna demo uh, our integration with Vector real quick, just so you see what that looks like. And then I will uh, set you all free to go and work in the lab. So again, you don't have to worry. We do have, you know, this lab is meant for you all to, to mess around with. So you can log in. All right, if you have, if you're like, oh man, What's the login? You can go and click in notes again. So scythe and vector credentials. So unicorn, I got the password. Takes a minute to log in. And then, so what we're gonna do follow the instructions. So we are going to site demo. You'll see there are a couple other ones that you can look at here. Um, we're going to do assessment actions, do import log. And so this is where you can drag or drop or browse. If I could get my touch scrolling to work. So this is where that CSV, that first campaign, uh, you can just open that. It'll tell you whether it's uploading and then we hit submit. Oh, maybe I didn't click. There we go. All right. So now we have first campaign. We can click on that. And so you can see all of the different discovery collection, what was run. So this correlation is super important. And so part of the reason that I want to highlight this is so you have a timeline and being able, you know, part of, you know, I, I keep saying, you know, enterprise grade and, you know, I, I, I do work for sites. So obviously I'm going to plug their stuff, but regardless of what type of red team tooling you're using, being able to ensure that you can link all of the techniques you're running is extremely important. Because in the worst case scenario that you find yourself co-located with a real adversary, you want to make sure that you can 
uh, as a tester, as a purple teamer, as a red teamer, as anyone who's running tools that may perform adversary-like activity, you want to make sure that you are free and in the clear so that when that incident response response team is coming through and performing those investigations that you are not adding to the noise and adding to the work that they already have to do. So they're most likely going to be a team of people that is trying super hard to figure out things and you having a bunch of commands that you're like, I don't know if we ran those or not. Like I'm going to have to go check a bunch of stuff. That's not going to be a great answer. Um, so that's where having that is, you know, the advantage of, of some of the paid for tools is that that is something that is expected. Um, so you can see all the test cases here. You can see that the status was completed. We can pick what, what the outcomes were. I mentioned before, you know, do we want to say, okay, was this detected? Was it not detected? You know, uh, if it wasn't detected, was it logged? We'll say yes. You know, we can say this was, you know, uh, we can say Sysmon. You can tag different things. You can tag detections, prevention mechanisms. If there are things like, for instance, that uh, evidence files, right? If if an adversary leaves a specific um, file in a, a folder location, uh, you'll see, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, threat actors that are trying to APT3, for instance, they like to stage things in the recycle bin. So if you have specific evidence files that you want that, that should have been detected as part of this emulation, you can have all of this stuff here. And with that, I think uh, we are pretty much done. So the Sand Slingshot Edition is over here. I mentioned before, you can click and go to Sand Slingshot uh, and mess around with it more. Uh, it's like I said, it's open source. If you you know if you have your own environment, I'd encourage you to set it up on that because it is really cool to play around with the different uh, different uh, command and control frameworks. So each of them has its own quirks. Some are command line. They work really well uh, on you know, Windows. Some work on, on Mac, that kind of thing. And so uh, I'd encourage you to sort of play around with that uh, when you can. So, but unfortunately, the Scythe, uh, Scythe, as far as its demo, is for the duration of the lab. Uh, if you're interested in under, you know, understanding more afterward, you know, we've got a couple, uh, George, myself, and a couple other people from Scythe here, we'd be happy to set up a time, uh, you know, in the next coming weeks or months to do a, a more individual and tailored demo if you want. Uh, and if you're interested, you know, please let us know. So we try and do these types of events. Uh, you know, I was brought on recently, and, and this is part of what I'm going to be doing is sort of uh, having these purple team workshops, having some more sort of, we'll say, purple team education sessions and some of that and demos. So if you have questions, if you have requests, things like that, if you've been following Scythe for a while and you're like, hey, you know, I'd like to see a blog post on this or this topic is something that's near and dear to us, you know, let us know. Those, that feedback is important. And, uh, and so, yeah, with that, you know, I'll, I'll give a shout out to our, our swag store. You know, if, if you really like Scythe, but you know, don't, don't uh, quite, quite have the budget to pony up for, uh, for some of our enterprise offerings, we do have some cool shirts and uh, swag that I know uh, people spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out what the, what the best swag is, because we, we do try and uh, keep that uh, keep that available. So I will open it up now for questions and comments. And I will just shut up so that you all can, uh, if, if there are questions that I think are for the entire group, I will, um, I'll read them out. I'm not going to read your name. Uh, so you don't have to be worried about, you know, getting someone, uh, me, me saying, Oh, so-and-so asked this. Uh, so that's where, uh, I just want to make sure that this is a workshop. This is an education session. So you have my time, you have George's time. And, and so we are, uh, we are here to, you know, do Q and a thanks everyone. Have a great day all. Thank you for joining. Hopefully we see you at the next workshop or Unicon, uh, 21 on April 9th. Have a great day.